heaven thundered and the world was born life begins and ends in the dust you fall faith commanded and the mountains move fear is losing ground to our hope in you sing it out unstoppable god let your glory go on and on impossible things in your name they shall be done freedom conquered all our chains together for our great God.
Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, thank you so much for engaging and singing with us this morning. Worship choir, thank you guys for being here and all the musicians leading us. Um, good to be together this morning and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Bo Eckert, the senior pastor here at the church, and I'm so, so glad to be with you all here this morning. I'm going to kind of guide and lead us through and shepherd our time together this morning and I want to make sure those of you that are newer to Calvary Church uh, have felt warm, a warm welcome here from the people of Calvary Church and would love to be able to connect and engage with you and answer any questions that you have about Calvary Church. And in order to do that, we have a welcome gathering. It takes place immediately following this service out the doors to your right, right near the east entrance. You'll see a sign, a banner there that says welcome gathering. We'll have some staff, some volunteers. I make my way back there uh, just to greet you, to welcome you, answer any questions that you might have, whether this is your first time here or you've been here for a few times and you're kind of trying to navigate through uh, Calvary Church. Take about 10 minutes or so of your time, so we'd love to be able to connect with you there. Now, as always, when you walk through the door on a Sunday morning here at Calvary Church, we put a bulletin in your hands, and in that bulletin, there's lots of helpful and pertinent information about things that are coming up, things that are happening, things that are going on. Uh, I just want to highlight a couple for us here this morning. This Thursday is the uh, Faith at Work conference that I'll be participating uh, with some other uh, local leaders from around here, but also around the country, called Taking Faith into Monday Work. What does it look like uh, for us to have a proper understanding of a theology of work um, and to understand is work a curse or is work a, a calling? So uh, it'll be a kind of a short one-day interactive event this Thursday, March 22nd at Lancaster Bible College. Uh, there's information in the bulletin, and you can see up here on the screen if you're interested in that. Two weeks till Easter. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our Easter weekend here at Calvary Church. Uh, it'll begin Friday night with a, a Good Friday communion service, 7 o'clock right here in this room. Uh, we're looking forward to that time together to, to remember, um, to have time of worship, uh, to Remember Jesus' death through the taking of communion. Uh, so 7 o'clock here in this room, uh, you can see in the bulletin what we're providing for children. There's an opportunity for some children's ministry uh, that night, so you can see what we're providing for that uh, in the bulletin. And then two days later will be Easter Sunday morning. So lots of information here about Easter. Let me briefly go through it for you. We will have three Easter services, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. Uh, there will not be ABFs, there will not be student ministry, there will be children's ministry. Uh, it'll be a little bit different at each of those, uh, each of those times, so you, again, you can see uh, that information in the bulletin. And one of the things that we're hoping for from the, the family of Calvary Church is for those of you that are able to serve, uh, to stop by one of the connection centers, to go on uh, to the website, uh, you can see that information in the bulletin to be able to sign up to serve in guest services, to serve in children's ministry. Uh, we're going to kind of really need this to be a, a, a Calvary Church day where we all come together uh, to fill those slots that we need in order to make Easter Sunday happen here at Calvary Church. The other thing that we're going to do and, and try this year, we're not sure how this is going to go, but uh, because we're having three services, because of parking and getting in and out of the parking lot, we will be having uh, some, some refreshments, some snacks. It's not a full-on breakfast, so don't come, you know, expecting pancakes and sausage and all of that. But we're going to have some refreshments, some snacks in Fellowship Hall kind of all throughout the morning, uh, starting about 7.15, 7.30, uh, and then all through the morning. So whether it's before one of the services, after one of the services, you can uh, stop by there, fellowship with one another, uh, uh, grab uh, a little bit something to eat. Um, but that will not be available after the final uh, service. So at a uh, little afternoon when, when that final service ends, we'll, we'll be done uh, for the morning and off you go to your Easter uh, plans. Um, we have the invite cards uh, that are available. These are in the baskets in the lobby. So take one, take five, take ten. It's a reminder for you. It's a reminder uh, to, to hand out to others to invite them to come with you. Uh, so take advantage of using those cards. They're in white baskets out in the lobby. You can grab those as you go. 
Well, we're going to turn our attention to the Lord. We're going to pray together now. Let me uh, give you a quick update as we do that. Uh, the Puerto Rico team that we sent out this week to do some hurricane uh, relief stuff there, they just got back late last night. I actually saw some of those team members here this morning. They had a great trip, great ministry took place, and we'll look forward to debriefing that and let you know uh, if there's going to be future trips uh, to go and to help get that camp ready for their summer ministry. So, uh, so thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. Uh, we're encouraged by what God is doing uh, in and through uh, the response uh, in Puerto Rico to the, to the hurricane from this past fall. So let's bow. Let's look to the Lord now in prayer. Father, thank you that your church is both proactive and reactive to what's happening in the world today that we are proactively sharing the good news of the gospel and seeing the transformed lives that that brings about. But the church is also ready and equipped to react to what happens in the world today. So when tragedy strikes, uh, when difficulty comes, when there's an emergency, that your church is ready to respond to that. So thank you for the response uh, that so many have had, not just from this church, but from around the country to uh, some of the different hurricanes uh, that have hit uh, this past fall. And thank you specifically for this team from Calvary and the ministry and the work that they did. Uh, in Puerto Rico uh, this past week and help and guide and lead us as we look at what that future ministry looks like. And Father, as we see um, when tragedy does strike, when hurt and pain does come into our lives, we respond to that, but it's also an opportunity for us to do uh, a, a heart check and see where our heart is and see where our soul is and see where our walk is with you. So Father, as we continue to sing this morning, as we look into your word, would you do some work in our hearts today? Help us to, um, to have a heart uh, that's undivided, a heart that is uh, after your own heart, uh, and a heart that is um, clinging to yours, inclined to yours. May we guard our hearts, and may you do a work in our hearts and in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to sing now, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned in glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who bore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiance of perfect love Now shines for all to see Your name, your name
by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our God has robbed the
give you all the honor and glory this morning. We praise you for defeating the grave, for being the, the risen king, the resurrected king. Thank you that no matter what we're going through, we can look to you, you're, you're by our side. We praise you for that. Thank you for loving us. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. When we prayerfully plan our Sunday morning worship gatherings here at Calvary Church, there's some things that we know and there's some things that we assume. One of the things that we know is that every time we gather here on Sunday morning, there will be a diverse group of people gathered at Calvary Church. Different backgrounds, different ages, different places on where you are in your walk, in your journey with God. Some of you, you're here for the very first time at Calvary Church, but the other group of people that we have in mind, and it might only be just one person out there, but we also think of that person that might be here for the very last time, that you might be giving God one last chance. So one of the things that we know is the diversity of people that are here on a Sunday morning. But one of the things that we assume, we're not 100% sure, but we assume that nearly everybody in the room is here because you are at least somewhat interested in your walk and in your relationship with God. We assume that there's not necessarily many people, although there might be some, that are here against their will. 
that you're just here to make mom happy or grandma happy or somebody druggy here, or you're here just because you're kind of going through the motions of church on Sunday morning and it is Lancaster County and that's just kind of what you do. But we assume most people that are here have an interest in their walk and their relationship with God, even though that might be very different and very diverse from the person that's next to you. So with that assumption in mind, that you're here and you're interested in your walk and your relationship with God, I want to start this morning, I want to ask you, how's your heart? How's your heart doing this morning when it comes to your walk and your relationship with God? You see, God cares a whole lot about where our hearts are this morning, no matter where you might be with him. Some of us, we think that God's just concerned about my external behavior, that God's just concerned about the things I'm doing and not doing. But God cares most about where your heart is today, and throughout Scripture, we see his concern for our hearts over and over and over again. Let me give you just a couple quick examples and see if you can relate to any of these this morning. Psalm 34 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Is your heart broken this morning? Is your spirit crushed today? Psalm chapter 9 says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Maybe you have a thankful heart this morning. Hebrews chapter 3 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Some of us, even though we desire a walk in relationship with God, our hearts are hard towards him this morning. Our hearts are hard because of some difficulties that have happened in life. Psalm chapter 73 says, My heart, my flesh, and my heart may fail. Maybe physically, but maybe even more so spiritually. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Proverbs chapter 4 says, keep your heart. Some of you have memorized this as guard your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. How's your heart doing this morning? But you're going to keep that question in mind, and you're going to see how that's going to kind of track through the theme of our time here together this morning. And as we do that, we continue in season two of the one story. We are tracing the one story that God has presented to us in his word and his scripture. And we are in season two of that one story. We're kind of right near the end of season two. And this whole season, as we've traveled through these early chapters of the Old Testament, has been categorized as from the promise that God made to the great nation that he's going to form. He made a promise to one man, Abraham, and we saw and read about that promise in Genesis chapter 12. And that promise was going to come to fruition, and we're going to see how that's going to come to fruition today in 1 Kings chapter 10. So we've been at this for 10 or 11 weeks, and now we're going to see and connect the dots from beginning to end. Not with the whole one story, we've been kind of doing that throughout. But really in this promise that God's saying, I'm going to make a promise to one man and I'm going to bring about a great nation. What we've seen in between the promise that he gave and the great nation that we're going to see today is all the books that we've worked through and the timelines that we've worked through and the genealogies that we've worked through and the ups and downs through the book of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then we saw what happened with, you know, some great things happened in Joshua. And then we go down to the bottom of Judges. But then there was a bright spot in Ruth. And now we've been working through the lives of some significant men Saul and David, and today, Solomon. David, who we looked at last week, was a man after God's own heart. So we looked at where his heart was before the Lord. 
And because he had a heart after God, did that mean that he was perfect? And the answer is absolutely not. David had what we would categorize as some of the, the biggest and greatest failures. You know, we like to rank sins, and David would be right at top, top of the list. Adultery, murder, trying to cover, cover that up. So did, did the fact that he had a heart after God mean that he was perfect? No. And as a result of the sins that he committed, was there consequences to those sins? Absolutely there were. So it doesn't just mean that because we know that God forgives, oh, we can just kind of do and live however we want. No. He brought pain and suffering into his life and the people that were closest to him. But he still had a heart that was after God's own heart. And today we're going to see one of David's sons, Solomon, bring the nation of Israel to the height of its power, to the height of its influence. And David's desire was to pass along the heart that he had to his son Solomon. And he did that through the things that he taught his son. Any good parent is going to teach things to their children. So 1 Kings chapter 2 tells us that when David's time to die drew near, he had some things from his deathbed that he wanted to say to his son Solomon. He said, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Here's what I want to pass on to you. I want you to be strong and to show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes. So there were some things that he passed on verbally to his son. And his son received those and put those into practice. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, we see some of the good that was there in Solomon's life. Chapter 3, verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord and he walked in the statutes of David, his father. There was things that David taught him that Solomon put into practice. He understood having a right relationship with God. So he came and he prayed to God. And he said, give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? Solomon had the opportunity to come before God, and, and God said, ask of me anything that you want. He could have asked for, for riches and for wealth, but he asked God for wisdom. He understood the position that he was being put in as king, and he understood what was needed in order to function in that role. So he asked God for wisdom, for understanding, for discernment to be used not just to advance and further himself, but to effectively lead God's people, to effectively make good decisions between right and wrong. When we ask God for wisdom, which we should, are we doing it just to further and advance who we are? Are we saying, God, I want to distinguish between right and wrong. I want to be a good leader in the places that you've put me and the influence that I have. It was good that Solomon asked for this. And the commentary tells us that it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. So there were some great things that David passed on to his son Solomon that he put into practice. But just as in any parenting situation, there's not only things that we receive from our parents that are taught, but there's things that we receive from our parents that are caught. Not things that we hear, but things that we observe. And there were some things that Solomon probably observed in his father that maybe weren't the best. And one of the things that we're told happened with Solomon was that he made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. That was not a good choice. And we're going to see, as we progress in the one story, the ramifications of this and the consequences of this. 
And you say, why is this a bad thing? Deuteronomy chapter 7 tells us why it was a bad thing. God said, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Is this because God doesn't like uh, cross-cultural marriages? Interracial marriages? No, not at all. It's not what God is saying at all. God was giving them a warning that if they did this, they will turn away your sons from following me. You see, the crowd that we keep, the people that we spend time with, particularly the person that we marry, will influence us and will influence us in the biggest and most significant areas of our lives. So God said it's not a good idea to intermarry because you will get drugged down and you will start to follow other gods. You see, sometimes we have the opportunity to be a good influence on other people in our lives, absolutely. But sometimes I've heard young people say, yeah, I know that that person that I really like and really want to be with is not following the Lord, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, be a good influence and, and bring them, you know, closer to God. They're not going to draw me away from God. I'm going to bring them closer to God. And are there times that that has happened? Absolutely that happens. However, if I were to ask somebody to come up here this morning in the front row, and stand here on the ground in front of me, and we were to grab arms, would it be easier for them to pull me down off the platform or for me to pull them up onto the platform? And you say, well, that all depends on how strong you are. We know you, Pastor Bo, you'd probably be able to pull everybody up here in the platform. <laughs> no, but if you've got two people that are fairly equal in strength, much easier to pull the person down than it would be to pull the other person up. And that's often the case in life as well. And this is why God gives that warning. Because God know, knew that it would be easier for them to get pulled down than it would be for them to pull somebody up. So he warns against that intermarrying. But Solomon made that marriage pact and that marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. We're also told that he sacrificed and he made offerings at the high places. And we don't have time to get into all exactly what this means, but there's commentary throughout 1 Kings that this was not a good thing. That maybe these sacrifices that were being made at these high places, maybe they were being made to the Lord, but probably they were being made not only to the Lord, but to other gods as well. So what we're told in 1 Kings chapter 3, we've got this intermingling of Solomon having a heart for God, but Solomon also having some things there in his life that really led to him having a divided heart. David had a heart for God. Solomon's heart seems to be divided. And I don't know about you, but when I think oftentimes about my own heart, I say, you know what? I know what that feels like. I know what that struggle is to have a desire to walk and to follow with the Lord, but I can relate to the verse that talks about the spirit being willing, but the flesh is weak. I can relate to Paul in Romans chapter 7 saying, the things that I don't want to do are the very things that I do, and the things that I want to do are things that I don't do. There's a, there's a desire in us to follow and to walk with the Lord, but sometimes that doesn't always translate in life. The father that brought his son to Jesus, who had a demon, and Jesus said about having faith to drive that demon out, and the father said, I believe, help my unbelief. Can you relate to that? I know I can. I believe but there's times of doubt and unbelief that are there, and there's times that I feel and can relate to that heart being divided. But even with that struggle of Solomon having a divided heart, God still was going to work through him. God still will use us, even in the midst of our struggles. 
as our hearts look and are directed towards him, God will work through us, no matter what might be going on there. And we see that with Solomon. We see how God used him as a leader to build his great nation. We see the commentary in 1 Kings chapter 4 about his wealth and his wisdom. This is not a, a health and wealth gospel aspect. This is not, hey, if your heart's right towards God, God's going to make you rich. No, it's not that at all. But 1 Kings chapter 4 tells us what God had done for Solomon in order to use him as the leader of this great nation. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. I love the detail there. And we're going to look next week at the wisdom literature of what Solomon passed down to us and how practical it is just to get through everyday life. The Proverbs that he has passed on because of the wisdom that God gave him. And look at the breadth of knowledge that he had. He spoke of trees, from the cedars in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He spoke also of beasts and birds and reptiles and fish. Sometimes we think that, you know, the things that we enjoy in nature and the things that we kind of you know occupy our work and our time and our hobbies that they're kind of secondary to you know serving and loving the Lord now God gives us great wisdom and interest about all that he has created and we not only want to rightfully interpret God's special revelation his word of God but we want to rightly interpret his general revelation the creation that he's given us and he gave Solomon great wisdom for that and many of you have those types of interests in life and I would affirm that and say it's a great thing you love birds you like to go bird watching you like to go fishing and you understand and tying fishing lures and all you know it's great to have those types of hobbies and those types of things. And God gave Solomon great wisdom in those areas. And he used him, and he used his talents, and he used his abilities to point other people to God. And I think God wants to do that in us as well. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. He's using the abilities that he was given in order to point people to God. Do you do that? Do you look and do you understand how God has uniquely made you and your interests and the things that have happened to you as opportunities to point other people to him? That's how God used Solomon. And Solomon was used by God to fulfill the promise that God had made to build a great nation. Now, we know this is not the end. Throughout this series, I've been pointing how all of it is eventually going to end in the work and the ministry and the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But as God is working out this promise and working out this one story, he promised that he would bring about a great nation. And over these last weeks when we've seen and worked through all the ups and downs, the belief, the unbelief, the battles won and lost, the good leaders, the bad leaders, the good choices, the bad choices, God had made a promise, and that promise was going to come to fruition. And we see in these early chapters of 1 Kings that that promise is coming to fruition under the leadership and the reign of King Solomon. In Genesis chapter 15, God made a promise to Abraham that his offspring would be the number of the stars in the sky. He said, Abraham, look at those stars. You can't count them, but that's what your offspring is going to be like. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, we read that your servant in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. We see the fruition of this promise coming. That these are a great number of people that you can't count. We're told in 1 Kings chapter 4, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. 
He told Abraham, look at the stars in the sky. Now he's saying, as many as the sand by the sea. Same type of analogy. Not going to be able to count the number of people that are going to be a part of this great nation. And during the reign of Solomon, there was a time of peace for this nation. He had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan even to Beersheba. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree. All the days of Solomon. You see, during the reign of David, David won a lot of battles for the nation. But during Solomon, there's a time of peace. 1 Kings chapter 5. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. This was a great nation by all accounts. And as a result, as a result of the peace, as a result of the fact that there was not battles being fought, as a result that the people were prospering, Solomon comes and says, I'm going to fulfill that desire that my father David had of building a home, a temple for God's glory to dwell in. That was Solomon's desire. And that's what took place. And you can read in 1 Kings chapter 5 and 6 and 7 about the, the building of the temple and the, the detail that went into that. Just as we saw the detail that went into the tabernacle. The detail that goes into building the temple because of the, the character and the nature of who God is. And when that temple was complete, here's what we're told took place. The priest came out of the holy place and a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The temple was filled with God's glory. Why? Because God wanted to be in the midst of his people. This has been the desire from the beginning some of us view religion and view relationship with God as God is off and God is at a distance. And if we do the right thing, hopefully God will be satisfied with me. And the pagan religions down through the centuries, they've had gods that they've tried to appease and take care of. Hopefully we can keep these gods happy. But they've never had a desire to have a relationship with the people. From the beginning, God has desired to have a relationship, to be with his people people. Exodus chapter 29. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, tent of meeting, tabernacle. From the beginning God has wanted to be in the midst of his people, dwelling with his people. So we saw it in the tabernacle. God there and amongst and with his people. Solomon now builds the temple. The glory of the Lord fills it so he can be with his people. And the desire was that the people would come and that's where they would experience the presence of God and that's where sacrifice would take place for their sins. But it wasn't just those people. People were supposed to come from other nations. It was a come and see mentality. Come and see who this God is. Come and see how great this God is. And you too can have a personal relationship with that God. Now, I got to be careful because I, if, if I might get really excited here this morning. So I'm going to try to stay under control. But I need to connect some dots for you this morning. I need you to see how the one story connects all together. When Jesus... The second person of the Trinity pulled on skin and showed up on planet Earth. The language that his followers used to describe what was taking place was this. John chapter 1. The Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, it means to tabernacle among us, to tent among us, to be with us. The same language that was used in the Old Testament of, about God tabernacling with his people is now applied to Jesus. Jesus comes and dwelled with his people because that's what God has always wanted. 
and we have seen his glory. God revealed his glory in the tabernacle. God revealed his glory in the temple. God reveals his glory in Jesus Christ as Jesus comes and dwells with his people. So in the next chapter, John chapter 2, when Jesus was teaching, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they assumed that they were talking, that Jesus was talking about the physical temple. But Jesus was talking about his body as a temple. He was speaking about the temple of his body. You see, the Old Testament mentality was the, the, the Holy Spirit of God, the glory of God, fills the physical building of the temple. Now Jesus is saying, I'm the temple. Destroy this temple, and it will raise back up in three days. Why? Because God's glory was in Jesus. His body was housing, was tenting the glory of God. So what happens next in God's plan? Jesus dies on the cross, rises from the dead, ascends back into heaven, and promised to send the Holy Spirit. And what has he done? Sent his Holy Spirit to again dwell in buildings, to dwell in our furnishings and the things that look great in this building? Is this building the house of the Lord? No. I'm sorry to say it's not. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, so you were, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The Old Testament model of the temple being there and God's glory filling that temple has been replaced by you. I know that this will be a struggle for some of us. So we can interact and talk about this. But there are no longer any sacred spaces. There are no longer any sacred buildings. Because God is dwelling people. The person sitting next to you is more sacred than any physical place on planet earth. This is the reality of what scripture teaches us. God was doing one thing when, when Solomon built the temple and the glory fills the temple and it was a come and see. Now it's a go and tell that God's glory, God's spirit fills the believer in order to go and tell. And do you see if you've been tracking all along with the one story, you go the whole way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. He made human beings to be image bearers of God. Image bearers of his glory. That's what he desired all along. The coming of the Holy Spirit into us restores what God wanted from the very beginning. For you and I to be little image bearers of God, taking his glory to the ends of the earth. Do you see that? Does it make sense? Is there any life out there at all? Is this worth my time and effort to help you to see these connections? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm not sure if you're tracking with me or if you're thinking about who's going to win Bay Hill this afternoon. If you're worried about your brackets that got busted because Virginia lost. I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking about. Okay. One more thought. Paul says, Christ in you. Not in the temple. Not in the building of 1051 Landis Valley Road, but Christ in you. The hope of glory. Solomon builds the temple. Solomon dedicates the temple. And he prays this prayer to God. He says, O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant, keeping your promises, showing your steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all of their 
external behavior? No, with all of their heart. And he goes through this list of all the things that he wants God to do. And he goes through this list. He says, God, hear from heaven. Hear from heaven. Hear from heaven and forgive. And do all the things that we're asking you to do. And as part of the prayer that he prays in the temple, he also says this. He says, when a foreigner who is not of your people comes from a far country, for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. It was never only supposed to be about them. They were always supposed to be a light to the nations. It's never supposed to just be about us. That nation was blessed in order to be a blessing to others. You and I are blessed in order for us to be a blessing to others. In order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. That's what God's desire has been from the beginning. His glory going through all the earth and everybody knowing and entering into a relationship with him. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him. For those of you that have been here, maybe that word incline is familiar. Joshua told his people to incline their hearts to him. If you look up that word in a concordance, you see that word and that concept all throughout the Old Testament. And most of the time when you see that word, it's encouraging people to incline themselves to God or it's asking God to incline his ear to our prayers. That word incline means to stretch out or to extend or to reach. But do you see what Solomon is doing here? He's asking God to incline our hearts to him. He's saying, God, make this happen in us. Reach our hearts. Stretch our hearts out to you. No matter where your heart might be this morning, remember the question we started with. You might have a hard heart. Your heart might be failing. Your heart might be struggling. And Solomon prays, God, incline our hearts to you. Do you know why? So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. And then he ends this way. He says, let your heart therefore be holy, true to the Lord our God. Let your heart be holy, true. Solomon is saying, <laughs> I don't know if he understood the irony of his prayer. And for those of you that know what would happen with Solomon that we're going to get into in season three, the irony of this prayer, of Solomon's divided heart, but he's praying that our hearts would be wholly true to the Lord. Where's your heart this morning? No matter what you might be feeling, no matter what struggle you might be going through, is your heart wholly true to him? As he gets to the end of his prayer, as he gets to the end of the dedication, he sent the people away. They blessed the king and they went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord has shown. You know, sometimes, and I know I do this a lot, and it's the reality of my own life, the focus can be so on the circumstances and the struggles that we have. And oh, we're going through this, and oh, we're going through that, and those things are absolutely real. But in the midst of the struggles, are we able to rise up as followers of God who live not with an earthly perspective but with an eternal perspective and say, though my heart and flesh may fail, my strength is found in you. And I see that you are the covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. And it doesn't mean that my heart has to be happy, but that my heart can have joy. And that I can respond and I can worship you because of the goodness of who you are. 
And he sends the people away with a joyful and a glad heart because of the goodness of God. And you flip over a few chapters to 1 Kings chapter 10. And the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. So she says, I've got to come and I've got to see this for myself. And she shows up and she meets Solomon and she sees the kingdom and she sees this great nation. And you know what her response is? Her response is not, oh, Solomon, so great and wonderful. Her response is, blessed be the Lord your God. Blessed be the Lord, your God. Why? Because he fulfilled his promise of making a great nation that would ultimately lead to the coming of Jesus Christ, who would dwell among us and give his life for us, and that he could do a work in us so that even though our hearts and our flesh may fail, We can find joy and we can find strength in him and who he is and what he's doing. So we come and we see this promise fulfilled by God. We see this great nation and I could preview where we're going and we've got lots more steps to take in this one story. But I want to invite the worship band and the worship choir to come back. And I want to give us the opportunity to just celebrate No matter where your heart might be this morning, and I know some of you, your hearts might not be in a place that you can fully engage. So just listen. Just take in the words. But for those of you that are a place that you can say, though my heart and flesh may fail, my strength is in God, we want to be able to rise up and sing and say that the Lord is good, that his mercy endures forever. And no matter what we might face, we're so thankful for the mercy and for the grace and for the goodness of God. So I want to invite us to engage and I want to invite us to worship now. Let's stand to our feet and do just that. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we were.
Man, sometimes, no matter what we might be facing, it's just good to put our hands together and thank God for who he is, for what he's done, and for his goodness. So I hope that's a great, great encouragement to you. Um, as you head out the doors, a reminder of the welcome gathering out the door to your right. Lunch will be served after the next hour if you're staying. Um, if you're interested in coming back tonight, there's a hymn sing in the chapel at 6 o'clock. Love to be able to connect with you there. And we look forward to completing season two next week in episode 12. God bless you all. Have a great day. You're dismissed.